We think women need to talk more openly about money because money really matters. It shouldn't be embarrassing or confusing. Join the conversation. We'll be discussing a whole range of topics which will help you get comfortable with your finances. Money Matters, brought to you by AJ Bell. Hello and welcome to the AJ Bell Money Matters podcast. I'm Danny, and I'd normally be joined by Laura, but this week we've dragged in our head of campaigns, Jenny Putley. Hi, Jenny. Hi, Danny. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. Now, don't worry, the pod's going to follow exactly the same lines as ever. We're going to talk through our one big thing, which this week is going to be changes to employment law being put forward by the new government, and in particular, those bits that should help in the ongoing fight to narrow the gender pay gap, the right to flexible working, and the day one right for unpaid paternity leave for employers. Plus, We've got a fantastic interview with the hosts of a new podcast about changing career in midlife called The Wobbly Middle. But before all of that, I think we need to let everyone get to know you, Jenny. So I thought a bit of a quick fire round of questions. Okay, Uh, I wasn't expecting this, but let's go for it. So... The listeners now, you guys know Laura and I pretty well. I'm married to teenage daughters. I'm over 50, whisper it. Uh, And my eldest just turned 18, which made me feel really, really old. So you got kids? No, I don't have kids. I've uh, been getting those little digs from family um, because I got married last year. Um, But my baby is my whippet called Herbie. And I probably spend, well, not as much as a kid, but I do spend a fair bit on toys and clothes. Um, But we're also, my husband and I are also in the process of buying a house. Um, So it's been a little bit stressful. We got to a certain point and then it fell through. Um, But we've uh, had some good news over the weekend with another house. So fingers crossed. Oh, exciting times. And you work behind the scenes a lot of the time on the Money Matters campaign. So people will know your stuff. And you're massively into this campaign, right? Yeah, that's right. So if you see anything on social media, it's probably been me. If you see too many GIFs on our Instagram stories, that's definitely me. Um, And I helped to set up Money Matters a long while ago, um, about three years ago now. Um, And I've been uh, really enjoying kind of going along with the ride and uh, supporting all the other ladies on, on the Money Matters team. Well, I'm sure we'll get you back in the podcast again. Um, And Jenny came along to a fantastic event um, recently because we've done quite a bit focused on midlife. Um, And I just want to give a huge shout out to all the Queen Agers who came along to our noon finance jamboree a couple of weeks ago. That was great, wasn't it? Yeah, it was so much fun. The the feeling in the room was really electric and the conversations we had were brilliant absolutely fantastic crowd and i know we've done quite a bit recently focused on later life and obviously we've got the guys from the wobbly middle podcast on this episode so it's really great to get the perspective of a younger member of the money matters team especially when it comes to our one big thing this week which is all about employment rights Yes, the new Labour government has unveiled its Employment Rights Bill, which is a piece of legislation that promises to deliver the biggest employment law shakeup for decades. There are 28 reforms, including the right to protection from unfair dismissal from day one, the end of fire and rehire, and the right of, for workers on zero hour contracts to request guaranteed hours after a defined period. Now, of course, the legislation will apply to all workers if it gets through Parliament, which isn't a hard task considering the Labour's uh, massive majority, but it won't actually come into effect until the end of 2026. Now, there's loads in it, but we did want to focus on a couple of changes that could be massively important to women because, of course, money matters. It's all about empowering women when it comes to their finances and helping them navigate those financial wobbly bits like pregnancy and maternity leave. And one of the new measures will protect pregnant women 
those on maternity leave or those back at work for those first six months after having a child from dismissal. Currently, women can't be dismissed if the reason is that they're pregnant, they've got a pregnancy-related illness, or because they're taking maternity leave, but can be dismissed if there is a fair, unrelated reason and their employer follows procedure. Now, earlier this year, we did get enhanced rules put in place for pregnant women and mothers on maternity leave regarding redundancy, but these changes are still really important. And I remember that period, um, deciding what to do after you'd been on maternity leave, facing the prospect of your child having to go to a nursery or some other kind of care. It was really unsettling. And the thought of trying to get back to work at that time when, let me tell you, money is tight, and then not having a job that would just be absolutely terrifying. And I know Jolie Brearley from Pregnant Than Screwed has been posting an awful lot on social media about some of these changes. And um, we did a fantastic podcast with her earlier this year. And she's got some really interesting stuff to say about things you need to think about when you are pregnant and then hopefully not screwed. We know lots of women work part-time and sometimes just a few hours a week. So news that a form of statutory sick pay for lower earners is a really welcome addition to the bill. At the moment, anyone earning less than £123 a week can't claim sick pay. And though the sick pay for lower earners will be at a lesser level, it will still be pay. Also, flexible working, which I know many women with caring responsibilities do, and that's not just with young kids, but those looking after parents or grandparents. Well, employees will be able to ask for that from the first day of working. And crucially, employers will be expected to agree unless bosses can prove it's unreasonable. Yeah, that's a big one. I know we've had a lot of discussions about that on Money Matters Um, and low pay. You know, it is something that is a huge issue for women. And let's be honest, the glacial change to the gender pay gap is something that we've spoken about a lot on this podcast. If you haven't already seen it, then do take a look at our Financial Wobbly Bits report on the AJ Bell Money Matters website, because it is packed full of really interesting data And it's also got a toolkit to help you navigate your own financial life. But it's great that the new bill will require large employers, we don't know the size yet, but likely those with over 250 employees, to produce an action plan to address their gender pay gap. So not just report it, but to say how they hope to tackle it. And we've also just been talking about um, pregnancy and maternity leave, Well, the data shows that whilst the pay gap is very narrow or even negative at younger ages, it grows significantly once employees turn 40. Many factors, of course, contribute to that. But just looking at the split, we know maternity leave and caring responsibilities play into that. And those larger firms will also have to support employees going through the menopause, something many employers are now doing but they will be mandated to do it. Thank goodness. I think the menopause has rightly so come into a lot of um, press recently and yeah, absolutely should do. And another thing which is brilliant because obviously it's so important for women to go off on maternity leave is paternity leave. And under the new rules, fathers will be eligible for paternity leave from day one of employment. So they won't have to wait at the moment for paid paternity leave, which some employees offer at the moment, dads have to wait 26 weeks from starting a new job to be eligible. And for unpaid paternity leave, they have to wait a full year. So this is a really positive move. Though, of course, the unpaid part means lots of dads whose companies don't have paid paternity or share parental leave policies, it'll still be impossible for them to take off more than a few days. And last year, we chatted with a couple of dads from AJ Bell who have had, they've taken parental leave and they said it made a huge difference to their relationship with their children. It's helped their partners get back to work with less stress and earlier than they might have otherwise done. 
Yeah, it's a really uplifting listen. It's on our Optimism of Youth podcast if you want to um, seek it out. And one last change that I wanted to mention before we move on to this week's interview, it is the increased protection against sexual harassment, strengthening the language around the protection from taking reasonable steps to prevent it to taking all reasonable steps to prevent it. It will also be added to the list of protected disclosures under existing whistleblowing provisions. Um, and you know, with all the new stories that have been around over the last couple of years about sexual harassment in the workplace, this is a really important addition. Absolutely. A really, really important one. But as you say, these changes aren't coming into effect for a couple of years, uh, and that will give employers a chance to get ready. But there are a number of things that are not in the bill, which we're discussed, uh, including the right to switch off, which has been kicked down the road. Yeah, I mean, that idea of an employer having to follow specific guidelines of when they can contact you by email by phone call, by text, you know, when you are off, maybe on holiday or just on your scheduled days off. And I think today it is just way too easy to be on a Saturday and Sunday. And I'm not saying that I do this, but I absolutely do this just to log on to your work laptop because it's sat on your kitchen table. It's such a difficult balance. It's almost, um, you, you feel like you should be doing, should I be doing more? Am I doing enough? But I need to allow myself time to rest and recoup. So yeah, I know it's very personal to everyone's uh, each own lifestyle, really. And it's quite difficult because in some cases, you know, maybe your shift has changed or maybe um, someone's gone off sick and you've been given an additional shift. And those kind of notifications, they need to be made. So I think this is one of the reasons that um, it's not in the bill, but uh, the Labour government says that they want to look at it further down the line. And not being able to switch off and having to juggle a demanding career and a demanding personal life. Well, they were big reasons for our next two guests to decide that midlife was the point at which they needed a career change. Yes, I've been really looking forward to this um, to this interview. So it's with Susanna Diaga and Patsy Day. They've both reinvented themselves in their 40s. They took the plunge to step away from successful roles and pivot to something else. It was a journey they found lonely and overwhelming at the time. But since then, they've spoken to loads of women who've told them that they've been through the exact same journey. And those conversations have now become a new podcast called The Wobbly Middle. Danny spoke to them about the challenges they faced and the role finances played on their career pivots. Susanna, Patsy, thank you so much for talking to us on the AJ Bell Money Matters podcast. You recently have launched your own podcast called The Wobbly Middle. Um, And after our Wobbly Bits, Financial Wobbly Bits survey, we know all about the wobbles that impact a woman's life. But what is it in particular about the middle that you're concerned with, Susanna? So the wobbly middle is really helping women who have had the first part of their career, they've loved it, perhaps they haven't loved all of it, and then they've sort of popped up and the catalyst might be any number of different things, but they've popped up, they've sort of emerged and they go, I think I want to do something different, but they're not necessarily even sure yet what. And so we're trying to help people navigate from here to there, i.e a sense of more certainty of what they might want to move before, if it's entrepreneurial, if it's a complete change in career, or if it's the same career but in a different setting, and then that as a starting off point. But it's really that section that the wobbly middle is focused on. Patsy? Yeah, I think it's exactly that. You know, uh, a lot of women step back from their careers for a number of reasons. It might be childcare, it might be um, family care or or just that the realities of life as sort of you, the ambition in your your 30s kind of comes clashing in with the, the the culture shock of a corporate world as you're trying to balance everything and so we step back and uh, then a few years pass and if we have children they might be a bit older 
Um, and we look up again and we say, right, now we're ready for something. But it's very hard to know what to do. And so what we talk about, we're talking about confidence issues, how to start, what are those first steps you can take. Um, and since the podcast launched, we've had such a wonderful response. For people that don't know you, um, Susanna, just share a bit about your backgrounds, how that middle bit of your life changed your career trajectory. So I started my career in financial services and I did sort of 15 years almost without thinking, mainly because I really enjoyed it, by the way. So it was really positive. I had lots of room for growth and opportunity. And then for me, what happened, and it's going to be different for everyone. But in my case, my children were young. My husband and I were both running at full tilt. And at some point, I just thought, God, it almost feels like a choice that, you know, my marriage is is not fine. I'm not finding this easy to balance. And they just collided with one another, the responsibilities for home, the kind of parent I wanted to be, and two people running at really pretty full tilt. And so I stepped back and I had this real sense of I need a pause, I need a break. I need to work out what I want to do with this next phase of my life while being a present parent. But of course, it couldn't look the same as it had done in the past because those demands, those structures, they weren't reconcilable with the demands of my home life in this period, which would be forever. And so for me, it was very much about how can I do something that keeps me intellectually engaged and financially engaged in my career but in a completely different way and it's really confusing it's quite you feel like you're in a washing machine <laughs> there's so much going on and it's really hard to map a path forward when you're busy you're busy with all the other things in your life you're busy with peeling yourself away from that identity that you've had for a long time and that can be a really confusing space to be in and then you're trying to positively identify the shape of something new and that's my wobbly middle I've filled it with lots of things podcasts obviously but a bit of consulting working in part-time roles and it's been really fulfilling but it's lovely to speak to other women and hear other women's stories that make me think it's not just me that finds this a bit tricky or that doesn't know exactly what the answer is. Patsy, it's interesting that Susanna was referring to it as a washing machine. I always thought of it more like a blender. Was it similar for you? Uh, well, again, like Susanna, I had a job that I really loved as an intellectual property lawyer. I did anti counterfeiting work. I did litigation and then non-contentious stuff. And then during the pandemic... Well, I, I had caring responsibilities for an elderly relative. I have two small children. And I just found it grinding, you know, and, and that love was gone and I was exhausted. So I decided to take some time off, thinking that I've got another 40 years of working life, probably about 25 years of working life left. And I want that to be meaningful. I don't want to just plow on. I was taking a break now to invest in later. Um, and then I stopped and to recover, you know, I really did just do nothing. I read, I hang out with my kids and my husband. I watched a lot of TV. And then when I slowly began to emerge, I thought, I don't, I know what I don't want to go back to, but I don't know how to move forward. Um, and then, and, you know, I spoke to people, some opportunities came and I'm slowly finding my way through it now. Funny you mentioned the pandemic. Um, for me, it felt during the pandemic that the lid had come off the blender or the door had opened on the washing machine and it just became harder and harder. Uh, do you find that a lot of women are saying that when they talk to you on the podcast, Patsy? Yeah, I think that the effects of the pandemic are, you know, it's a slow burn. It's going to take us a long time to realise how deep it is, the impact on children, for example. I think people are reevaluating re what work means. And I also think that along with the pandemic, women in their 40s, you know, they may have come into their 40s during the pandemic. We've got perimenopause. There's a lot happening for us. Yeah, Susanna, I would imagine that that is something that you're hearing an awful lot of because it was a huge change. And suddenly you're working from home. So instead of being able to sort of 
walk out of the house and put your professional person on, your professional person and your home life, they were colliding. <laughs> it's totally right. And on the one hand, there's some positives that come out of that in terms of flexibility, but those boundaries were ripped down. And I really find this in my personal life, when there's no divide between those two worlds, if I've had a bad interaction in my work life, I feel like it rolls very squarely downhill towards my children. And I don't like that. And I think that lots of women would identify with that. When you are busy, the people that you sometimes feel get short shrift are the people you care about the most. And I think that the pandemic really exacerbated a lot of those forces for lots of people. And Susanna and I are very, obviously, we think flexible working is amazing. We are are also seeing that the other side of the coin is that it's having, a, in some environments, having a negative effect on women's progression at work because um, the statistics on who is coming back into the office more, it's more men that are coming back into the office. The women are, are tending to stay at home because they tend to do the wraparound care at home. Uh, we are speaking generalizations, but because they're true. Um, and then also there are studies which showing that you know, to in order to get those promotions, it's about people seeing you, it's about you being in the room, and that's a struggle for women. And I think it brings us on to, it sort of glides into the bigger problem of uh, women leaving the corporate world in their 40s and 50s. Uh, and uh, I read um, a statistic recently, which was that for every woman that's promoted to a director, two are leaving. So there is a you know, we are losing a lot of women from the corporate world at the moment, and we really need to do something about it. And of course, that impacts women's financial situation as well, because if they're being passed over for promotion or they're just finding that they don't want that corporate life anymore, that that is tough. So have you got any tips for women that, that maybe they're in this right now, but financially, they just can't figure it out. I think it's really difficult because on the one side, you've got the balance you want in your life. And then on the other side, but clearly related, there's financial reality. And the two, again, can collide. <laughs> um, <laughs> seems to be a theme of this podcast. <laughs> and I think that we've spoken to a number of people, most notably Helen Wright, who runs a recruitment agency, 9 to 3 herself. And she spoke about there are ways to navigate to a new phase of your career without cliff edging. And, you know, it's something that we're going to cover a lot in the podcast is how did you do it? What do you wish you'd known? What's the how to the playbook of moving from here to there, both if you are in a position or by design or, or by circumstance have to take a break, but also very importantly for those people that are not going to be able to take a break. And how do they do it? It and how do you create space for identifying what it is you want to move towards? Yeah, Helen started off by saying, I'm a big believer in conversations. She said, you're not going to get a new job without speaking to people and letting them know you're looking. Equally, if you start to have conversations with your friends, maybe reconnect with second degree connections. So not necessarily those you're working with, but maybe people in the past. If you start speaking to people, you will also... Uh, have things, you know, you might say, oh, well, I just, I, I've just lost confidence. And and someone who worked with you will say, but you're amazing at this. And so those conversations can really kind of build you up because you're busy thinking, I can't move for all of these reasons. And if you start speaking to people, not only will you hear the good things about you, but you'll also hear about ideas. You'll hear what's happening out there. And I think that another really important thing is those conversations with work in the corporate um, in the corporate environment. And to that end, for listeners in the corporate world, I really recommend that you read a book called Revolting Women by Lucy Ryan. And she is it's such an easy read. And she 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 ends on, you know, she speaks why women are leaving and then she says what we can do about it. And she talks really about putting this issue of women leaving the, the workplace uh, you know, making it a positive agenda um, and uh, corporate entities really looking at where their pipe is getting leaky, you know, the pipeline of women coming, where, where is it leaking? Speak to them. Why is it happening? What, you know, really putting it at the forefront because they're losing a lot of talent. 
and they're losing senior women who will then go and shape policy. So, you know, what we're trying to do on the podcast is women who are feeling wobbly, we want to energize them to find fulfilling work with the end goal of women having careers that that shape the world for everyone else, for the women coming up after them. And it can be hard. I um, have a lot of friends in their 40s and 50s who've um, maybe wanted to change career. They've maybe taken some time out for caring responsibilities, either for kids or for older parents, and then trying to get back into the workplace. Often, uh, I know many of them have found it incredibly difficult because that employment market in some cases still looks at older women and writes them off. So can we change that? Is that changing, Susanna? I think it is. And we are, as you would imagine, having this conversation a lot. But there's a gap that we are identifying already very clearly, which is people talk about experience. And often if you speak to a recruiter, a traditional recruiter, I would stress, they will want to put you in what you've done before because that's, you know, square peg, square hole. That's a good fit. And what we're talking about is that lots of people, not just women, I've had men reach out already directly, ex-colleagues, lots of people that we don't know too, saying, when are you going to do the male chapter? So this isn't just a male experience. (laughs) However, I do think that there is this problem when you're trying to move to something new, that people want you to go back to the experience you have. And we need to reframe that as what are the skills you have from that experience? So Patsy's an ex-lawyer, fabulous. She doesn't not have her lawyer skills. They don't not come with her when she moves into something new. I can tell you that as her business partner. Um, But it's really (laughs) so important that we don't feel that we are sunk cost, that we lose it all because you don't. You have skills you're taking with you. You may need to be taught how to reframe them in the new direction you want to move into. That's a skill in itself. How do you make sure that a new employer or a new venture benefits in a way that you have really drawn out explicitly. I have these skills from this experience. I'm applying them into this new domain. This is why they're important. But I think that too often people are a bit simplistic about how they view that. And we can all help shape the conversation around why that doesn't need to be the case, particularly for people that have taken skills, uh, career gaps rather, and actually We've got a really good example coming up of Donna Krauss, who talks about the skills she gained doing charitable work or parent-teacher association round a kitchen table with mum friends and how then when she shifted into being a professional food photographer, those skills that maybe she hadn't given that much weight to, they all came to the fore and she suddenly saw their value. And so I thought that was really a lovely realisation. And Patsy, I know for a lot of women at that sort of age as well, they're not just thinking about the next chapter, but they're thinking about the last chapter. They're thinking about being able to leave the workplace because you go through perimenopause, menopause, you've raised your kids, you get tired and you want to be able to think about having a good retirement And there is concern then about pensions. Maybe you've not paid enough in. Maybe if you leave whatever workplace you're in, you're not going to be able to add to your pot just when you need to. Well, I actually want to hand this over to Susanna, who's a pension specialist. So I feel it will be wasted on me giving my two cents worth. Um, Yeah, you you directed that to Patsy. We'd already decided that one would come to me. Uh, (laughs) I think it's a really valid point. And I think... It's undeniably a problem. It can be really intimidating if you want to take a career change, particularly if you're going to become self-employed, to want to keep up your pension contributions. I think the thing I would say is that should be a conversation with your advisor, always. You need to look at the trajectory you're on. Ideally, you need to save as much as possible early as possible and manage it with appropriate risk, which again is something you know more about than me, but women typically don't have enough risk in their portfolios. But it is, sadly, women are not captured often by the algorithms that we're benchmarking pensions on, and that needs to be looked at. So AJ Bell can pick that one off on your side. (laughs) I'm sure you do already. Uh, 
I think broadly, if you are in the position that you have a partner, there's conversations to be had about perhaps cross-pollinating with contributions so you don't have a gap. But it may be that you just need to plan for a gap and then not allow it to be too long because that's the danger is you stop paying into a pension pot and then you forget to restart. And all well, of things the... are tight, so you don't prioritize. Exactly. So maybe that's the other thing. You have to prioritize it once you start. And that and when you are doing your you know, your business model and you you're doing your costings, build your pension into your costings as if it's a business cost. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's easy not to prioritize and you're right, money matters is all over women and pensions because it is a huge issue. Um, Patsy, I'm going to throw the superwoman question to you then, because um, I grew up, I was brought up in the 80s, and I remember the conversations and the images and the, the sort of the whole idea that we could have it all. We would be working, having amazing careers, and we would have families, and we would be wealthy and have wonderful lives. And you get to a certain point, you're doing all of that, but it's hard work. Yeah. Um, I think that what I've learned quite recently is that the shape of a woman's career looks different. And we all think we're going to have a linear career like, like we saw in the 80s growing up. Um, and we saw our parents have had, our fathers particularly, have had very linear careers. You start working and then you stop working and you retire. And that's simply not the reality for women. Um, but what makes it so difficult is when we start off in our 20s, even now with the way the workplace is now, well, not even now, especially now, there are as many men as women going, say, into the legal practice. When we look around, we see men and women in those lower levels of the professional ranks. And then as we rise up, we're in our late 20s, we're also getting promoted, we're also on the partnership track. And then we come into our early 30s, which is when you really step into those senior roles where the experience of your twenty, and that's when it begins to fall apart for us. And we're suddenly thinking, what just happened? I thought I could have it all. This is what I've been told as I've grown up. And I think that accepting the reality that our, our careers look different, but that we can have our careers again in our 40s and our 50s and our 60s. And if, if we begin to recognize the different shape of our careers and corporates begin to, not that the corporates are the the um, big bad, the the big baddies out there. It's just a useful term for me to use the illustration. If they can also recognize the different shape of women's careers and start to make room for them. You know, uh, a lot of the time we think, uh, and let me say how much I believe in maternity leave, especially after the discussions that were last year, that, uh, that, that came out last week. But, um, you know, maternity leave is amazing and it's wonderful. Part-time work is amazing and it's wonderful. But, you know, those are all part of a picture um, where we want, need to see the, the businesses making room for women to come back in their 40s and 50s. Because we tend to blame, as women, we tend to blame ourselves for for taking different decisions, for going on a journey that maybe doesn't look like the one we expected, Susanna. I think it's really difficult. As Patsy said, we have an image and then when it deviates, it can be quite a shock because you think, oh, it's all the same. It's all the same. We're all in the same boat together. And then you realise we're not. It, it, it It's it's going to take a different pathway. So there's the sort of mourning for what was. I think that there's also the reality that that doesn't have to be a bad thing. I think, as I said earlier, this is a male and female phenomenon. If anything, sometimes it can be a gift, even though it may not feel like it at the time, to be able to stop, take stock, look at what you want to do, to be given the step away, whether it's through parenthood or other caring or just my values have changed. What do I want to do? It's then quite intimidating to step back in. That's where we want to help people. But the actual ability to take stock and not just carry on on the sort of conveyor belt of your career without thinking is a real gift. And to be able to look around and try and make a proactive decision as to what 
you really want to do, what what really fires you up, what you find energizing, inspiring, intellectually engaging, whatever it may be. You might be, as we had a letter the other day from somebody, somebody that's working in HR at a big corporate, she's now gone into painting and decorating. That's a beautiful shift. And then the letter was so inspiring, talking about just how happy she is with this new career. She wants to build her own business. And I think that it's really, we need to frame it not as something that's happened to us, but something that we can take as an opportunity. And actually Helen Wright, who we're releasing that uh, on, on the 10th of October, she speaks about this beautifully. She was made redundant while she was pregnant, as 55,000 women a year are in this country. That's going to smart. It's not going to feel positive when it happens. But if you can take that, as she really is one of the most remarkably positive people, and turn it into an opportunity, or at least learn from it, that's what we have an opportunity to do. Ladies, on that brilliantly uplifting um, bit of information, thank you so much for talking to us on the Money Matters podcast. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having us. Susanna Diaga and Patsy Day, hosts of the new Wobbly Middle podcast. Now, I know Laura isn't here with us this week, but the confession is her favourite part of the podcast. So did Patsy and Susanna share their confession? She will be delighted. and I know that she will listen back to this and Patsy even had two. I'll go first because I have two. One, I've not worked for nearly three years and I haven't paid into my pension. So that is a conversation I need to be having. I need to put my money where my mouth is. And my second uh, confession is much smaller, but I am very lazy when it comes to the auto renewal of subscriptions. And it's a real source of contention in our house. <laughs> um, so mine is that despite having run an investment boutique for nearly 10 years, I really don't count myself as a good investor. And despite the fact I will talk to people about the fact that they should see themselves as investors, I still really shy away from thinking of myself in that light. And so I need to deal with my own confidence on seeing myself as an investor. And yeah, I've never said that out loud. <laughs> well, you're in good company because uh, Baroness Helena Morrissey, um, our founding ambassador, she said exactly the same thing. And in terms of subscriptions, I'm right there with you. An auto renewal of things like insurance as well. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> So those are really good confessions there. And actually, Patsy's one is something that I kind of relate to a little bit. I went self-employed for one year and I didn't pay into my pension for that year. Um, I did some calculations and it turns out it's going to be about £12,000 that it would have boosted my pension by. So I'm making up for it, but really good confessions, very relatable ladies. Yeah, and Susanna saying that even though she gives investment advice, or at least she did in a previous career, and she knows it inside out and backwards, still when it comes to her own finances, she just doesn't feel confident. And imposter syndrome, I think we have absolutely all been there. That's all we've got time for this week. Our next episode will take a look more in depth at the gender pay gap and focus on the day in the year when women actually should stop working because they've only been paid up to that point when you compare women and men's pay. But of course, you probably can't do that because I'm not sure your employer would like it. We're going to talk to Alicia De Freitas from the Fawcett Society, a charity that campaigns for gender equality and women's rights, and about Equal Pay Day, which is a huge day on their calendar. So thanks to Jenny for ably stepping into Laura's shoes. I'm sure she'll be back. Yeah, I definitely will. Thank you for having me. And I'm looking forward to the Fawcett Society. I've been waiting for a podcast like that. So I've loved it. And do keep the conversation going on social media. I am all over our social media pages. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, X and TikTok. And we'd love to get your comments and suggestions. Um, you can also send us an email 
it's hello at ajbellmoneymatters.co.uk and please sign up to our newsletter you'll find the link on the website until next time thanks so much for listening before you go please remember this podcast is for educational purposes and the views expressed don't necessarily reflect those of aj bell the podcast isn't telling you if a certain investment is suitable or not don't forget that the value of investments can change and you can lose money as well as make it it's also important to remember that how you're taxed will depend on your individual circumstances and rules can change The way an investment performed in the past may not be the same as how it behaves in the future. If you want help, go see a qualified financial advisor.